Welcome to Ravenous Nails Film Talk, and this time we're talking to the wonderful Morris Bright, film historian, journalist, broadcaster. There isn't anybody who knows more about the movie industry in this country or any other country. So who better to have part of the Film Talk team to talk to us about the greatest films ever made as we try and compile those top 100 best films of all time, in our opinion. Morris, welcome. I didn't write that intro. No, no, well, no, but you did pay me extensively for it. But I still didn't write it. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to be here. But it was all right. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. And so what's going to be your contribution to the greatest movies of all time on this particular episode of Film Talk? My passion is film, and it stems back a long way. Uh, and I think a lot of it goes back to when uh, you're very young and the mm. things that influence you. Um, and probably the film that I love the most, and still do to this day, is Some Like It Hot. Billy Wilder? I'm a huge fan of Billy Wilder's mm. work anyway, and it would be <clears throat> very difficult not to um, put several of his films in a top ten. Um, and when we talked about doing this series, and there's going to be several over several months, um, I could have literally done most of them as Billy Wilder, but I thought if I had to yeah. choose one, if I have to choose one, it would be Some Like It Hot. And what is it about Someone Like It Hot that really... I mean, what a stellar cast. Uh, Jack Lemmon, uh, Tony Curtis... Marilyn Monroe. Uh, Marilyn Monroe. And Marilyn Monroe, in my opinion, was never better than in black and white. Perhaps in, perhaps in Niagara, um, she looked absolutely wonderful in, in colour and in Technicolor. But she was, there was something about her that was just so beautiful in black and white. And, of course, many of us know the stories of how difficult she allegedly was while she was filming. It's and a lot the, of those stories. And the issues that yeah. Billy Wilder had with her while she was filming. But what he got out of her in the end was absolutely tremendous. I think it's a film that doesn't take itself too seriously. Uh, and in doing so, you get the very best out of the performers. Um, they're all, if you think about it, you've got two top American actors mm. dragging it up. Um, and, and that's, 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 that was quite, I mean, even that today. That was unusual, yeah. even in those days. Yeah, and that's, you're talking about, like, about 1959. Yeah. Uh, and we're prepared to do it, and prepared to really go for it, so much so that when you look at Tony Curtis, I mean, he's not unattractive. You know, <laughs> um, calm down, easy time. Easy time. Jack Lemmon, of course, is um, slightly more like a, a beloved auntie that you might have. But you had that great cast, and it just clicked. Uh, mm. The script was crisp. When I first saw it, of course, I saw it on television, and I saw it for many years on television. Um, and I got an opportunity, I think, in my late teens, maybe early twenties, to go and see it as it was made on a big screen. And I would recommend that anyone who's a fan of film of my age or younger, who's got favourite films that uh, came from the days before they could go and see them in the cinema, go and see it. Because you just see the beauty of not just the performances, but mm. the way it was shot. Sh I mean, there was, you know, every shot counted. And it's not a short film, it's a good two hours, but it makes you laugh and it gets a tear in your eye. Uh, the story's convincing, the script is crisp, and of course one of the greatest payoff uh, finish lines of any film that's ever, ever been made. <clears throat> that Moment on the boat, yes. That moment on the boat when you've got yeah, Jack yeah. Lemmon and he has to finally admit to Joey Brown that Joey Brown wants to marry him, her. Um, and he just has to come up with all these reasons why you can't. You can't marry me for this reason, for that reason, for this reason, for that reason. And in the end, he just thinks I can't be doing with it. And he pulls his wig off and he says, oh, I'm a man. And he says, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> So that's really, it's a great ending too, but it's a lovely film. And it's one of those films that I, 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 I say gives you that Saturday matinee feeling, that film that you can watch in the winter yep. when it's cold and it's depressing outside and you just put a film on that wraps around you like a blanket. I was very lucky to meet Jack Lemmon in the late 1980s because he was a huge hero. One of, mm. I liked his other films, the film version of The Odd Couple because I never got to see him on stage. Uh, the apartment, so films like that really I loved. And I got an opportunity to meet him the night I got engaged for the first time in 1989. He was appearing in a play called Veterans Day at the Theatre Royal Haymarket. And wow. I wrote to him saying, I'm planning to propose and we'd love to come and celebrate if she says yes. And he says, you must come round and have a drink afterwards. So I proposed to my first wife and she said yes and we went to see the show and went in after his, and he said, what did he say, and what did he say, and we had a picture taken with him and everything. He couldn't have been kinder. You know, some mm. actors can be... He very... has that reputation, doesn't he? Well, absolutely, and some don't. Of course, some, they've got the face, and some can be very difficult, and you know them, and I know them, uh, but some can be exactly 
as you'd expect them to be. And here was a hero. I met this hero. And he was exactly how I expected him. He couldn't have been nicer. And he said to me, Morris, he said, what did you think of the play? And the play was called Veterans Day, and it was to do with the army. And Michael Gambon was in it. And to be honest with you, I, I, didn't, I didn't get it at all. It was, and it was very boring. But what did you say to Jack Lemmon? And Jack Lemmon <laughs> says, so what did you think of the play? So he said, what did you think of the play? And I paused, and he looked at me and said, don't worry. He said, I didn't understand it either, and I've been doing it for four weeks. <laughs> so it was great when you get to meet a hero, and they're exactly as they were. And he was, and so as you see him in Some Like It Hot, that's exactly what he was like, a lovely, caring, funny, considerate person. So yeah, Some Like It Hot is, is right up there. The, the number of the plot, though? The number of the plot, St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Yep. Uh, and two uh, um, freelance musicians. musicians. They're not got any money. It's sort of, there's a recession going on. Mm. They'll take any, any jobs they can. They're in the car park when there's um, an assassination of a local mobster takes place. And they see it. Uh, and they are seen seeing it. And these mobsters know that they've got to silence them. So they go into their agent and they say, look, what have you got? What have you got? And they say, got nothing, got nothing. And on the way out, they hear that the, the, two, the job they have got is for two women players. Mm. So they think, well, you know, well ahead of Mrs. Doubtfire, uh, you know, but well ahead of Tootsie, all those years earlier. Yeah, they decide they're going to take the jobs, dress up. So they're good musicians, and they do. They dress up as women. They share company of women. They share the the bedding in the on the train. They share giving all the makeup together. Um, Tony Curtis is great because he's loving the company of the attractive women. Um, Jack Lemmon really gets into being a woman. He shares lipstick tips and makeup tips, and he's really rather <laughs> enjoying himself. And of course, there's that love story which is emerging, where Tony Curtis is falling in love with Marilyn Monroe. He has to pretend at one stage he's something far more important because she wants to marry someone with money. He mm. finds he can get onto a yacht and pretends he's a very wealthy man. Um, and of course, she falls for him but can't have him. And you're in a situation at the end where you've got a woman, Tony Curtis, wanting to be with Marilyn, and eventually he has to admit he's a man. And they do go off together. And as I say, at the very end, you've got Jack Lemmon and Joey Brown. Jack Lemmon admitting to Joey Brown he's a man, and, well, nobody's perfect. So it's a great romance. It's a great, great fun, great story. As I say, beautifully shot. Um, some wonderful acting talent in there, not just the top three. Um, and obviously a labour of love by Billy Wilder because, as I said, to get the, not, the, not just the cinematography but costume, to get the atmosphere right for that time, it's absolutely lovely. So it's an all-round great film and it's, and it's still tell, tell, uh, take test of time. Yeah, it does very well, I think. Just on a final point on Billy Wilder, though. In the notional hall of fame of filmmaking, you could have picked any... I think so, and I think that with Billy Wilder, he has to be up there with Hitchcock, um, and perhaps nowadays with people like Scorsese and, and possibly Tarantino if he does a bit more work. Um, and he's going to have to be up there very near the top because he was. I mean, he was, you've got your Stalag Seventeens, you've got your you've got your double indemnities. You could easily go for double indemnity. Uh, your film in the early forties of. Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck plotting to kill her husband to get the insurance mm. money. I mean, all his films just ooze professionalism and charm and script. Um, and he was making films all the way up to all the way up to the eighties. And I remember going to see a film. I think it was Buddy Buddy was the last time that they they bought uh, one of the last occasions. Well, last occasion that he bought Jack Lemmon and, and Walter Matthau together. They did some stuff after. And I remember seeing it, and it wasn't perhaps one of his best comedies. But even so. It was still pretty funny, and I saw it in a cinema in Israel, which was which was a bit odd, because it was all in American, but then there were Hebrew subtitles underneath, which confused me terribly. Um, and the audience laughed some of it. I laughed the whole way through. But even even his even on a not so good day for Billy Wilder, it's still a lot better than many directors of today. So yeah, one of my favourite directors and many of my favourite films. Perfect. And a great contribution to our top 100 list. 10 out of 10? 9 out of 10? 10, 10 out of 10? Oh, for me, it's something like, oh, it's 10. 10 out of 10. Yeah. Fantastic. Morris, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for watching Film Talk. If you liked our views on Some Like It Hot, leave a comment underneath. If you didn't, leave a comment underneath. But don't forget, subscribe anyway. Morris, brilliant. See you next time. Thank you very thank much. You. Look forward to it.